appreciate you all joining this discussion. Um, like maybe the first question I was hoping we could kind of just talk a little about is kind of reflecting on your time in service. Uh, what do you wish people in the community better understood about mental health challenges of some of the better, some of that some of our veterans face? I'm happy to maybe kind of kick off with an initial reflection. In my role, I have the privilege of meeting so many veterans. The mental health challenges that they might face um, don't necessarily have to fully define their life, right? It's not a binary. Veterans can thrive, be successful, start businesses, uh, become governor of the state. You know, they can run, run cabinet departments. And just because you have um, a mental health struggle doesn't mean that you also cannot uh, contribute in incredible ways and succeed in incredible ways. But I'm curious what you all have seen from that perspective. So look, I was in Fallujah in 2004. When I came back, you don't always recognize what you've went through. Like you, you don't know that like I'm a very different person than I was 12 months ago. The way that I had it best described to me whenever I was trying to figure out how different am I, what, what is going on, it's like your brain has been in a fight or flight um, battle for however long you've been there. And that recognition, it takes some time for your brain to rewire itself so that you can understand it's all right fight or flight, this isn't just going to Costco. That's what helped me understand. This isn't a hit on my masculinity. But what I think it's important for the community to know, the, the question that you asked, is that while we are going through these things internally, we are not broken creatures. This isn't what defines us. This isn't who we are. It's something that happened to us. It's something that we're gonna get through. But if you know anything about the military um, or people who've served in the military, even the families that, like we're incredibly resilient. You put us in a time or a situation, you give that to us, you give us our mission, we're gonna get through it. It's important to understand that, um, probably similar to law enforcement, first responders in general, um, in the military, you know, we train very hard to be prepared for a worst case scenario. When you train that way, you tend to miss some indicators that you might have some mental health challenges. I hit some bumps along the road, but I had really great people around me. I had an incredible support system. My leadership was fantastic. Everyone was always engaged, but I lost my identity in that process. I worked at, you know, 100 miles per hour constantly, and it, it served me very well for what I accomplished in my career. But when I hit that point of retirement, I didn't recognize the residual of having done that, and I certainly didn't recognize it in myself. Growing up, as an army brat. It's not unusual as a teenager or a kid to see a veteran come home and, and suffer mental challenges. But that mental challenge that veterans go through, it's not always recognized. In our society, even though we, we often say that we're the 1% of people who serve, there's a large amount of us who are suffering because we serve and nobody's seeing this. We're not getting that service always at VA hospitals, VA clinics because they're being treated, being treated for physical illnesses and not mental illnesses, and that's our problem. We, we, need to, we need to change the recognition of these things. When we serve, in my experience being in Afghanistan, uh, you put up that barrier, you're gonna make it through, but there's a cost on the back end uh, to that. I do remember being in the VA and they are quickly to go to the physical things that happen, but not as quick to d ask those mental questions. So why not put that on the front end? Those obvious things, are you broken? You can't hear? Yeah, they got that down pat. But start with that. So how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. But let me tell you about the little girl that ran up to me every day and grabbed me. Janina, Janina. And then three years later, she was killed by an, uh, an explosive device. And that just hurt me to my core. And I had not seen her for three years. Where's the follow up by the VA? that, that follow-up. So I don't think I was broken, but certainly wanted to talk about that. Rather than talk about my foot or my ankle, I wanted to talk about that and the, the experience. And then we can certainly, they can really very quickly go through all the physical things. It's important that people recognize who have in certain uniform is, is that the way that it sees people, hits people, et cetera, that it's not always predictable um, and that it's very individual. Uh, you know, I, I remember um, as we were preparing to head back and we were praying for, to redeploy, you're talking to your soldiers about here are the things you can expect, here's what's going to be different, driving and all those other things. And I remember when I came back home, I ended up having real difficulty with lights. No one ever said that that was something we would have a difficulty with, but I remember going back and just saying that lights were just, were very, um, were very triggering. And it really wasn't until I started having conversations with the docs on that that you know, they, they gave me a sense of peace and ease and, um, 
and space to remember, like, remember, you're in a, de a, a deployed zone, a combat zone, where there were no white lights. White lights weren't authorized. And so to go from that and then to be in Times Square, you have to give your, your brain and yourself a little time to and give yourself grace, allowing people to go through their own process with an understanding that they have just been through something that was a, a different and a challenging uh, situation. And that, that grace should be there for the people as they are they're coming back home. Mr. Governor, your comments kind of reminded me when I um, got back from my deployment. So in 25 months, I think I was deployed about 21 of those months. I had a small break in between my deployments to Iraq. And then the Army had a program where you can go to grad school. And so I got an opportunity to go to grad school. And what I didn't realize when I arrived, it just you know how off my game I felt, how depressed I felt. I just felt completely out of sorts. And you're so right, the like... Driving down the street, I still drive differently to this day. I am always permanently scanning, scanning the side of the road. Um, but when I when I got to grad school, I knew, man, I am not at my best. And I, what I realized is when you took me outside of the community of people who I had deployed with, and now I'm alone in this, in this environment where nobody had experienced that, I felt lost. And so I was really fortunate that the university had mental health available to all of us mm -hmm. at that time. And so took advantage of that and just sort of hearing her say like, well, it's actually normal that you're going to feel this way. You are, you've been plucked away from this environment and this community who understands your experience. And so it's normal for you to feel this way. And almost instantly hearing that it's okay to feel out of sorts and to not be okay, started to change everything. And from that point forward, I worked with her for two years and kind of worked my way back and felt much better as a result of it. Um, but what it reminds me of is the importance of community. Right. And so and just reminding folks to look for opportunities to reconnect, work on things that are greater than yourself. And if you can do that in the company of other veterans, all the better, because it really does help you. Maybe with that, maybe kind of shift to our next question. I'm wondering kind of the most significant barrier that veterans might face in accessing uh, mental health support. I'm happy to kick us off with this. You know, this is a large part of the reason why my department exists. We have uh, veteran uh, benefit specialists whose job it is to sit down with veterans and help them file a claim, help them navigate that process. I think a lot of veterans kind of hear the noise and hear the stories and think, oh, what one, they think, oh, that's for someone else. No, it's for them. But two, that it's gonna be this very long, complicated process. It's actually gotten much more, much shorter and much more user-friendly and even still, we have people whose job it is, who are accredited to help guide them through that process. When a veteran is connected to VA healthcare, they are 80% less likely to die by suicide than one who isn't, right? And so just gaining access to your VA healthcare benefits alone is a game changer and is quite important. But wondering if folks maybe wanna talk about um, uh, the most significant barrier that veterans face in accessing mental health care. There's a line in The Godfather where Vito tells his son, Michael, don't tell anyone outside the family what you feel. Mm -hmm. Veterans are like, are like that. They get like that. They, they get this stuff inside of them. They don't talk to even their families or anybody outside the family. And what they need to know is we all feel the same way. You know, that's one of my Baltimore City law enforcement issues when I had to go talk to the city psychiatrist, the police psychiatrist over a shooting incident, that we all felt the same way. Somebody said they felt fear, we all felt the same way. So you need to know that in that room, when you get together, your community of soldiers, they feel the same way. I would say that I myself was the biggest um, barrier to getting the help because the conversations are being had and I will tell you, um, insecurity about it is a barrier. I think it's also important to realize that with veterans, it might not connect just to a deployment. My own challenge started when my daughter felt like I wasn't there for her. Recognizing that it, there's just a variety of different factors and feeling comfortable knowing that regardless of what it's tied to, you can start to have that conversation, just like you guys are doing with this forum. Um, just continuing to push the message is gonna help tremendously with people realizing that they need to get out of their own way and they need to take action because the airmen and soldiers around them are looking for the, their leaders to do that. And if I could use this maybe as a quick plug, just to make sure folks know that Maryland um, has invested in uh, our, our contribution to making sure we have 988 infrastructure available. Yes. So I hope folks know that if they are uh, really facing an acute mental health crisis, they can dial 988 and press one to be connected with a specialist who is trained specifically to work with veterans, right? So that is a resource that is available 
right here in Maryland, all across the country, and I want folks to make sure they know that. But I wonder, Governor, if you had anything you wanted to add on this question. I think for each and every one of us, we left the service, uh, you know, with very real roles of responsibility. E8s and E9s or, you know, O9s or O03s or whatever, whatever your rank was. And oftentimes, the helpers don't realize they also need the help because we're spending our time focusing on our folks. Like we're making sure our, our folks are good. Do you guys have what you need? You're trained to eat last. You're trained to eat last, yeah. right? <laughs> we're trained to eat last. Yeah. And then when it comes time to help you, there's nothing left. And so we just kind of like, it's because we're good. We're fine until we're not. And then at that point, you don't even either A, remember how to go out and reach out for help. You don't feel like you need it or you should, and then it's too late. And so it shouldn't be lost on anybody that even when you're looking at things like suicide rates, that it's not like suicide rates are for, that you're watching higher spikes amongst the folks who are the E1s or E2s or E3s. You're not. You're seeing higher ranking individuals who are still also succumbing to this. Knowing what resources are available, and I have to give Secretary Woods, you've done a remarkable job within Maryland to make sure these, these resources are not just available, but quick and responsive. But then giving yourself the space to know that you gotta also help the helpers and leave that room to make sure that you're good. You know, take care of your folks, but leave that room to remind yourself that I need to be okay as well.